Welcome to the Modern Athenas podcast with Sonia and Debbie, where we discuss how regular women became Athenas in their own time by working hard, persevering through the challenges in their lives, and contributing to a better world. This is podcast 28. In this podcast, we will be discussing the book Feminist Fight Club by Jessica Bennett. You can use the link on our website at modernathenas.com to order the book after the podcast. We have explored the stories of many modern Athenas throughout history. In this podcast, we thought that we would take a bit of a different approach and talk about some of the things that all of us encounter as women in our day-to-day lives. This is the first of a few similar books that we will be doing in some of our upcoming podcasts. Some may call them self-help or leadership books. We call them empowerment books for modern Athenas. Today's book started out as a monthly huddle of a group of women in a friend's apartment who were burning off steam about their frustrations with their sexist male co-workers. It wasn't that their co-workers were blatant about their sexism. Well, not most of the time. No, usually they had this subtle, less pronounced, hard to identify, undercutting approach that made it difficult to name, to call out, and to prove. But it made it no less impactful. In Feminist Fight Club, Jessica blends the stories of the group with some research, statistics, and advice in a humorous way that empowers women to take on the sexist behavior and to destroy the self-sabotage that we engage in on a daily basis. There are dozens of different examples in the book, and we had a hard time choosing which ones to discuss, but we hope you will enjoy our selections. We apologize in advance for Jessica's colorful use of the English language. All of the fight moves are hers, verbatim. So now... Sit back and listen to how to stop sabotaging yourself at work. The enemy. The stenographer. The stenographer treats you like the office secretary, even when it's clear that you're not. Asking casualty if you'd mind taking notes, ceasing you on his travel arrangements, or ordering you to grab a coffee for a client, your client. Sometimes he inadvertently assumes that you are the secretary, or the kitchen help in the case of Melody Hobson, the black female chair of the board at DreamWorks. My friend Alia, who works at a nonprofit, recently attended a cocktail reception for a prestigious scholarship she'd won. Along with the other honoree, a man, she was asked to greet guests at the door. But instead of outstretched hands to congratulate her, those went to the man by her side. She received more than a few coats. People assumed she was a coat check girl. The fight moves. Bad barista. When a male colleague asks you to make coffee, tell them politely that you would be happy to do so if only you knew how. Or tell them you've broken the copy machine so many times you're not supposed to touch it. Cash in your woman card. Say no and explain bluntly that you won't be taking meeting notes because it puts women in a subordinate position. Throw to a bro. Suggest a guy for the job. You know who's great at making spreadsheets? Brad over there. Put the fucker in his place. You don't like something at my meeting? I'll be sure to fix my agenda next time. No volunteers allowed. Don't volunteer. So she's got some really good ideas on what to do when you're sort of treated like this office secretary. And I've seen this play out so many times. It's just this... I don't know if it's just this inadvertent thing that people do or it's just sort of um, blatant. They just don't care. Um, But it happens and it only seems to happen to women. Have you been in this situation? More than once. And usually it starts with this, oh, do you mind taking notes at the meeting today? Um, And it's hard to decipher because if it comes from another woman, I generally presume that it's because I'm the junior person in the room. Um, and if I am the junior person in the room and a guy asks me, I also presume the same thing. So it's hard to say, no, I won't take notes um, when you're the junior person. If I'm not the junior person in the room and a woman asks me, I generally presume it's still not related to the fact that they're asking me because they think I'm a secretary and maybe that's a sexist thing for me to assume. If it's a guy asking me and I'm not the junior person in the room, I automatically think it's because they think I'm the secretary. Um, And again, that might just be (laughs) a a blatantly sexist thing for me to do. Um, I've also been told numerous times, well, you're just really good at taking notes or like your notes are always thorough or your emails are always thorough. So can't you just do it? And it's like, well, my notes and emails are always thorough because when I do them, that's my job. I'm doing them for my work. I'm not here to be your assistant or your secretary. That's why you have one. Um, another problem that I have a lot is I didn't 
I don't do a good job using my assistant or my secretary. Uh, so I'm just as bad and just as guilty of doing some of these things. Um, and so I end up feeding the beast because I end up doing a lot of this work myself. Well, and it occurred, it occurred to me, um, that it's kind of a slippery slope and, and, and in the first time, like, for instance, uh, the woman, Alia, accepted a coat. She had a decision in a way to, to you know, and but it says she received more than a few coats. And, and in a way, when if we can identify those times, that first time um, when someone's, you know, pushing that limit, and if we can establish the limitation and, you know, put that boundary down, it would seem... And sometimes that's really hard because it it's hard to identify what is this? Is this, you know, um, kind of that in that more sexist category? Is it the more like, really, we are the best equipped one? I, I have no doubt that you, Debbie, are the best at taking notes and the best and the most organized and you're going to actually produce the best work. So, um, you know, it's like what category are we putting these into as well? And drawing the line that first time because it it's harder to draw it probably the second, third, fourth, fifth time down the road. Well, and I think for me, that's a lot of the problem, right? It's that first time. Because as you were just saying, like, it's hard to identify that, you know? So when she took the coat the first time, in the heat of the moment, in that one second, she was probably just like, she didn't even think about it. She just took the coat. It wasn't like, oh, I shouldn't be taking this coat. It just happened, you know? And it's the same thing with taking notes at a meeting. It just happens. And then it like two, three, four times, and you're like, this shouldn't be happening, but then you're two, three, four times down the road. And then what do you do? Right. So I think this is one of those things that's just really hard. And for example, the bad barista, when someone asks you to make them coffee and you kind of give that like little sassy response back, well, I would do it if I only know how, I don't know if I'd use that one. Um, Cause I do think that's a little sassy, but gee, whatever kind of word you want to use for it. And obviously everybody knows how to make coffee. Right. So I think you got to, use one of the other ones in that situation. I'm not, I'm not sure I would use those because that's not something even, you know, the way I do it and we can talk about it more as the podcast goes on, but in my mind, my standard always is, is this something that a guy would say back? Because if the whole, I would be happy to do so if only I knew how usually isn't a response a guy would give. So if it's not a response a guy would give, I'm like, "Mm, probably would stay away from that response. But a guy would definitely say, no, I I can't take notes at a meeting because uh, I'm just not good at that. Oh, that's a response a, a guy would definitely give. So yeah, I'd use that. Mm-hmm. The enemy, the lactator. The lactator is the colleague who views the mom on your team as preoccupied and unserious. He doesn't seem to know or care that according to research, mothers are actually more ambitious than their childless colleagues because he assumes that they are uncommitted. God forbid a woman commits to her family and her job. The lactator may not even realize he's made such assumptions. The women can be lactators too. But the data provides this cognitive shortcut is real. Female job applicants with kids are 44% less likely to be hired than childless women with similar qualifications, while just three additional little words on a woman's resume, parent-teacher coordinator, make her 79% less likely to be hired, half as likely to be promoted, offered an average of $11,000 less in salary, and held higher standards of punctuality. For black and Latino women, that penalty is worse and doubly problematic as women of color are more likely to be the breadwinners in their homes. The fight moves. Mom on the grind. Moms are more productive. Remind your higher ups that no one gets shit done like a mom. Committed to the job. Emphasize that despite caring for your children, you are committed to the job. Lay out your career goals post maternity leave with your boss and make it clear you are still ambitious. Say it out loud. Don't make assumptions. Don't assume because a mom leaves early that she isn't pulling her weight. Parents have to adjust their schedules. What's important is that the work gets done. Fight for flex time. Advocate for getting work done, not just being in the office. Compressed work weeks, flexible work hours, and autonomy may increase production. Fly under the radar. Come up with a different way to say that your appointment is kid-related. 
So when I became a mom, a few things happened and I, I changed a few things. One, I definitely restricted my hours because I had to. Um, I was very rigid with my in, in, out, in of office and out of office times. And what that forced me to do is actually put all of my energy into being like 125% efficient and I did not waste time. And that included, mind you, two to three 20 minute pump sessions for a year. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's interesting. Obviously, you have a much better take on this than I do because you're a mother, but I only have the other side looking at mothers. And I worked for a big law firm in San Francisco and I always loved the double standard that for parents. So we had this partner that coached his son's soccer team on Thursday afternoons. Nobody blinked when this guy took off at 1.30 to go coach his son's soccer team. But when this mom left on Wednesdays to go do her Girl Scout, her daughter's Girl Scout troop, everybody talked about her in the office. I mean, it just, so son's soccer team, okay. Daughter's Girl Scout troop, not okay. I mean, it just, baffles the mind. And then mothers, always a double standard. Dads, totally fine. Like no one questions their ability to parent and do their job. But for some reason, mothers can't parent and do their job. I just, I don't understand how people can, that that this double standard is so blatant and, and people have such a problem getting over this one. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I guess, uh, you know, it, it just forces us to like, if I really felt like I, I was going to have to almost in overdrive be more efficient and really lay down like this foundation so that my boss and my colleagues would trust my work so much that actually it would give me the freedom to freely move anywhere, anytime. And it I, frankly, it worked. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think that these tips for moms actually, I think, work for anybody, which is if you can show your boss that you can be autonomous, that you can get your work done, no matter sort of what schedule you're working on, you know, it, it's sort of that working under less direct supervision and the you know y you can do it anyway i think that these are all things that your boss appreciates and i think that this is going to lead you to success in the workplace yeah and the other thing i would say is for everybody i don't know this is my personal opinion but i don't tend to explain a lot of detail when i need time away um because frankly i don't think it's anybody's business i shouldn't have to give excuses it, it because I think everybody should be afforded that trust that they're taking time away when they really need it. Because that's what I try to do with my um, colleagues too, is, you know, I don't know, I don't ask questions about, oh, well, why do you need to leave at 3.30? Like, I trust that they are doing what they need to do. And I I kind of draw that line and kind of, um, I, I kind of force that, that, that trust in, in my decision making as well. And I don't know, I think that's just better for everybody. Yeah, share details maybe outside of those conversations with your coworkers, but not when you need, to, you're, you're trying to like ask for time away or anything, unless it's not being dis disrespectful, but I don't know, creating those boundaries have helped me. I think that that's totally workplace dependent. I've worked at workplaces where it's literally like, um, I'm leaving it to gotta go. And boss literally doesn't care because, you know, you're attached to the work by cell phone and they know they can reach you anytime, anywhere. They just don't care when you are in the office. So oh, if you okay. disappear for like three, four days at a time, they're going to be like, uh, you coming to work anytime soon? You working at home? Like, what's your gig? If you haven't checked in. I've worked for other places where it's like, it is 308. Where are you? Um, and they want to know to a T where you are going and what are you doing? And uh, that just drives me crazy. So yeah, I've worked for both. I think it's very workplace dependent on, um, how much sort of leeway you have. And, and, um, I think it's also job dependent, um, you know, on, on that. I prefer bosses that give me a lot of lead. Um, I like to give my people a lot of lead. Now, if you burn that rope, um, <laughs> that's a different story. Uh, but yeah, I, I also too appreciate the trust in 
if I say I'm going to leave at 3.30, that people don't need to ask me where I'm going. Um, you know, I put in enough work hours that I think that people should just have trust that I'm probably off doing something important and I'll be back tomorrow morning. The saboteur, the doormat. She's afraid to say no, even when she really wants to, and ends up overworked and exhausted as a result, placing the needs of others above her own. The doormat is different from the office mom in that she's not simply being tasked with taking on the mothering role. She's being relied upon to take on everything. And unfortunately for her, the remedy isn't as simple as saying no more often. The doormat isn't simply a pushover, though she likely knows that there's an implicit expectation that she says yes because she's female. Communal, communal agreeable, helpful. And she's right. When men say no to extra work, we understand he must be busy. But when women decline, they are penalized. They receive worse performance evaluations, fewer recommendations for promotions, and are considered less likable by their peers. So how do you say no without incurring the penalty? Or at least decide when the ding is worth it. The fight moves. Know you're wrong. Assess your place on the ladder and who is doing the asking. Assess the cost. Weigh the task before you commit. What is in it for you? What will it cost you to complete? Just say no. Remember that you are saying no to the request, not to the person. If you don't say no, you will have less time to spend on important work, for fulfilling work, or having a life balance. Under promise, over deliver. The other party isn't expecting you to say yes as frequently as you think they are. Quid pro quo. What's in it for you? Can they reciprocate? Okay, so I chose this one because this is me. I'm the doormat. Every job I've had, I am the doormat. Um, I am a fixer. I come in and fix things, but I'm also the doormat. So these, this know you're wrong, assess your place on the ladder and who is doing the asking. I do that, but it's always someone above me doing the asking, so that doesn't help. Assess the cost, what's in it for you and what it will cost you to complete. There's never anything in it for me, and it always is a high cost. Just say no. Remember, you're saying no to the request, not the person. I always feel like I'm saying no to the person um, and never the request. Under promise, over deliver. I always think that I, I, I never do that. And then quid pro quo, what's in it for me? There's never anything in for me, and they never reciprocate. So pretty much I violate all of these all the time. Yeah, this is hard. Um, <laughs> it's hard to not to, you know, especially if it's someone above you, you know, who's giving you something you don't want to, you know, you want to comply and do what you're being told, or you want to make a good impression, or you want to just be a, you know, a good, it starts innocently enough that you want to be a good team player. But I think for me, if I have, over the years, I've figured out more and more how I what circumstances contribute to me doing my best work and also you can flip that around and if you can figure out how then you can contribute to your colleagues best work too sometimes it's asking them more questions if they haven't taken their side of the project like far enough that you can really help like they haven't done enough research or they don't even know what they're asking for then sometimes you can draw that out of them um uh and turn it right back around and say, well, why don't, when you figure that out, why don't you bring it to me? Cause I'm swamped right now. Or, and I'm like right now at work in it, about to dive in the deep end of, a uh, of, <laughs> um, you know, having to prioritize and execute in a really rigid way, I think, um, just because I'm going to have a lot of work on my plate. And so this is actually a really good topic for me to think deeply on right now, because I think I might be entering into a place where this will be at risk. Yeah, so when I'm buried in work, which I have been the last two months, I still do this. Like I have this, and actually there's been this period the last three weeks where I finally got to a drowning point. And I've had a drowning point in another job before where I finally got to a point where I literally, the water is so deep that I drown. And that's the only time that I'm not a doormat. And then when I'm drowning that far, usually the solution by my boss um, is to just literally come in and take work off my desk because I will not, I will never push work off. Um, my current situation, my boss has had been for like weeks before being like, you need to 
push work off. Let's get you some help. But my current situation is very, very complicated. So I'm not going to go into that, but it's extremely complicated. My situation before, um, I wasn't in a, in a different job. I wasn't getting help that was should have been available. Um, and so that was a much different situation. That was definitely in some ways a gender-based situation. Um, also, that situation is, has arisen in other jobs wherein I'm a grinder. I'm really good at what I do. So people like my work product. So no one wants to give up my work product. So they all want me to do their portion. They're waiting for someone else to take off their portion when I'm drowning. So it's kind of like... They're seeing, they're all like standing at the edge of the pool watching me drown. And everybody's like, well, you go first. No, you take yours off first. And everybody just keeps watching me drown. Um, and in the middle, meantime, I'm just, I'm literally drowning and I'm not taking the weights off because I'm waiting for someone else to help me. So in this situation, this time at my current job, I've done a better job at just saying, okay, the weights are on. I'm drowning. I got to take the weights off and, and get to the surface. So I think it's something that, you know, you live and learn um, and you finally get to a point when you've done this enough times that, that you're like, wow, I, I can't. My next step is to stop drowning. Um, and so, again, it's it's getting to a point where, like you were saying, Sonia, you want to be good. You want to be a good employee. You want to do your job. You want to always do the right thing. But you also have to make space for yourself. And what she's saying here about this under promise over deliver um, I think that's true. And you've got to make enough space in your daily work schedule to be able to have that capacity to do a good job in delivering. And that's something that I need to work on a lot. Well, and that takes like daily discipline. I was thinking about kind of this, this doorway idea that the, the coat, the coat check woman that we heard in the first example, like what is that first that first time that this could lead down that path? And is there a way that we can recognize each day with every task? Like, I don't know, it would take a lot of faith that if I, you know, if we don't draw that line or assess that kind of um, the weight of that task um, at the very beginning, that we will end up underwater. It's like you, I wonder if you need like a fish tank on your desk to have oh, no, a visual like, reminder. Like, like definitely. <laughs> First of all, let's not talk about live things because other than my puppy, I don't have my, my keeping things alive like plants. I don't have a good, I don't have a good track record. But part of my problem is, is I have a like control issue with things. So like, I always like work to be done extremely well. So I don't like giving up control of work because I can't stand work product coming out less than perfect. Unless it's like there's an emergency or something and then okay. But like, otherwise it needs to come out pretty well done for me to be happy. So that's why I always take on more is because I'm, I'm just that thing. So um, when I have to push work off to other people, it's just, it's very disconcerting to me and I'm very unhappy about it. So that's definitely an issue that I have. I've had that forever. And if these people listening to this podcast who have known me in college will be chuckling because yeah, I've had this problem forever. Um, so that, yeah, that's another thing. I mean, maybe the fish tank would be wonderful. Um, if I could keep like goldfish alive, maybe I should get one of those <laughs> fake fake tanks I, I know that they have them um and just stick yeah. it on my desk to remind me next to your fake silk flowers because I can't keep flowers away uh, alive either <laughs> I have I have these fake um plants from Ikea and people think that they're real so it's perfect so anyway the saboteur the credit defaulter Ask a man to explain his, his success and he'll point to his innate qualities and skill, but ask a woman and she'll attribute it to things like hard work, help from others, or luck. The credit defaulter knows there is no I in team, but she often forgets that there is an I in I deserve a raise, I led that project, or I want a promotion. A product of centuries, if not millennia, spent denying women credit for their achievements and telling them they must be modest in the process, the credit defaulter is hesitant to talk about her achievements and even lowballs her experience relative to men. The credit defaulter makes the mistake of playing the team too much and not taking credit even when it's deserved, undermining her competence. The fight moves. Drop the grateful cred. 
Stop being grateful for all the help you had for the team. Don't give credit away like it's candy. Take credit where it's due. Make sure your individual contribution is known when working on team projects, especially if men are on the team. Accept praise. Say thanks and leave it there. Great work on your presentation today. Thanks, not thanks, but it was all really Harold, or thanks, but it was no big deal. Selective framing. I've already had six months of experience versus I've only had six months of experience. I thought this was a great one for me because I I feel like this is easy to do. It's to, to kind of like downplay when those times when people are complimenting you or give away credit because you don't want to seem like you're uh, arrogant or, you know, prideful or, yeah, it was really mine and, and take away from maybe the credit that is also due to your team. But um, I think there's... I was thinking a lot about this and I think that like drop the cred, the grateful cred, stop being grateful for all the help you had for the team. Don't give it credit away. Like it's candy. I think credit your team, but also with credit comes accountability too, is a good one for me to remember that don't, you know, I, I, I want to credit my team at where their skills and their contributions are, but also I have to remember that that also gives them responsibility to like uphold a standard too. Yeah. This one's, a very fine balancing act, right? Because you, this is that like humble and ego sort of sort of issue. So you want to be humble, um, and you want to you don't want to go out there and, and flaunt that like you're oh yeah I did a great job, you know, and like forget to thank your team um, and make it sound like it's all about you because you do have that team to to thank. Um, so you want to take take pride in your team. Uh, so you don't want to have too much ego, but you don't want to be like you're saying too humble um, and be like, no, it's all my team. I did nothing because then you're also actually going to look like a weak leader. Uh, so I think there is that balance um, in, in both. And yeah, not giving credit away like it's candy is important. And I think that there's a way to say like, yeah, you know what? My team was really strong on this. Um, and I was I was. I'm really glad that I have a great team behind me, um, you know, and it was an excellent chance for me to, um, you know, showcase their skills and mine. Um, and I really appreciate you taking the time to thank me. You know, you could always say something like that, right? But it's, I, I like the point about thanks, not thanks, but it's really Harold or thanks, but it was no big deal. I do the thanks, but it was no big deal a lot or, you know, thanks, but um, I was glad to help. Or, you know, I, those, I, I always qualify the thanks. So that was a, that was something good for me to read. Yeah. And you can maybe, if you feel like thanks just feels too short, you can say thanks. That means a lot, you know, or, you know, and I think that that really also respects the person who's giving you a compliment, which if you've ever given someone a compliment and then they kind of, it almost sometimes also feels like it's being brushed off and not, I mean, it's, it's, like you said, it's kind of this nuance and this balance, but um, I've, I've been on both sides of that too. And what I was going to say is uh, if you're looking for a way to make sure your in individual contribution is known, but you don't want to be too like overt about it, what I really try to do to keep is um, report back often with updates uh, once you know a certain portion of a task, I've done it. And that can be a really subtle, but like persistent or almost daily kind of a uh, way to keep either it's your boss or someone else who gave you something to do informed and it can it before you forget too um you know it's easy to forget all maybe not forget but maybe repress all the work that went into a certain project but if I get into a habit of daily updates or weekly updates or something I feel like that's a subtle way to um kind of make sure your individual contribution is known. Yeah, and I think it's also a subtle way to tell your boss just how much work is going into a project so that they don't just at the very end, they're like, oh, it was a cool presentation, that they understand how much work goes into these things. So yeah, I think that's a good point. The saboteur, the womb enemy. There is a very special place in hell for women who don't support other women. Meet the womb enemy, also known as the queen bee, the mean girl, and the unfriendly fire. The womb enemy engages in sororicide, turning her weapons on her sisters in combat, viewing fellow fighters as enemies instead of allies. The womb enemy learns her place early. Later, when that woman enters the workplace, she feels she must compete again to prove herself, elbowing aside the woman next to her in order to collect the golden ticket. 
The woman can take many forms. The guy's gal, the downhouse chick, the basic broad, the generational grenade thrower, the tag along. It's easy to disdain these women or to swear that we are nothing like them. And yet 95% of working women have felt undercut by another woman at least once in their careers, which means most of us have either met her, her or been her. The fight moves. Vegfirmative action. We are fighting the patriarchy, not each other. Hire women, promote women, mentor women. We need to get more women into power. Allies, not enemies. Address conflict directly and make her your ally. When she shines, you shine. Another woman's success is going to make you look brighter. Surround yourself with successful women and bask in their glow. It's not a cat fight. When women have a conflict, it's viewed as a cat fight. Irreparable and worthy of a grudge. When men have one, it's just a disagreement. Clitoral mass. The more women in your office, the better off you are. The problem isn't other women. It's a system that pits us against one another. Yeah, so it's not a cat fight. This happens all the time. Guys are like, oh, the chicks are fighting. But when the guys fight, it's just like a bro, a bro thing. This drives me nuts. <laughs> Absolutely nuts. Uh, well, you know, this this one is very there's lots of layers to this one <laughs> i think um and and you know the f- bottom line for me is this is like where i think we can do damage to ourselves by if we do, if we identify like if we we too if we too strongly paint continue to paint people into corners because it's uh then they're going to stay there. And I think that if this is one where I think that just setting a standard of behavior is really going to, is hopefully going to really help correct, um, correct a situation. I mean, this is no one, (laughs) you you don't, you can't be, um, being an enemy of anyone is not, not good in any form, whether it's woman or, or a man, I don't know. And and actually I would have to say, in my experience, I've actually only ever been thrown under the bus really by men um, and not necessarily by women, thankfully. <laughs> but I, at, at the same time, what I really, when I analyzed that situation, I was thrown under the bus by people who don't take ownership and it's it they are just um, unorganized and, you know, in, in their own right. And that's actually what I'd like to focus on as opposed to, oh, well, all men are going to always throw me under the bus. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, my, my problem with the woman me thing is that in an, <clears throat> in an office environment, I don't want to be the catty girl either. I don't like it when women all group together and do the catty gossip thing. I don't, I don't like it. I don't think that it helps promote anything except the the men stereotype that women do catty gossip i don't like it i just i like to in, whatever you want to call it quote integrate um or whatever i agree with you i think that in in these kind of situations um grouping together we're promoting each other mentoring each other hiring each other i don't think this does anything to help the situation now i let me let me rephrase that i think mentoring does um but I don't think that hiring each other does. I don't think that promoting each other does. I just think, you know, working in the workplace um, and showing younger, and I say younger, not necessarily in age, um, but more in professional level. I think that showing younger women that you can have success in this workplace um, and that you can do things um, professionally to move up the ladder, I think that those are the type of things where women can lift each other up. Um, But I think being catty or gossipy or really, you know, making allies in the office, I don't know that that's as as important. Um, That being said, I think that really focusing on these catty situations, they're annoying. So I have worked with women before that I blatantly ignore because they are into the drama course i've ignored guys before who are also into the drama um but into it an entirely different way so yeah again i don't know that this one is as much of a gender thing as it is a behavior well and it's hard too because like i think i know my own experiences with certain personality types are shaped by a certain person so if a person tends to take a lot of things personally, and I've worked with people who did, um, and we all probably have, if that person happens to be a woman, it's easy. I, I wonder, is it 
easier to kind of categorize that women take things personally or is it like I don't know what do you what do you think about that I think that women get categorized much quicker than men do yeah okay I see Mm -hmm. the saboteur the burnout The burnout exists in a world in which superhuman-like stamina is often required of women, and yet very few of us, if any, actually possess it. Men burn out too, but not as much. In one study of 18 to 44-year-olds, women were almost twice as likely as men to say that they felt very tired, exhausted, or worn out most days. That and overworking negatively affects women's health more than men's, and women... And for women with children, when the first shift ends, the second one begins. Kids, laundry, dinner, homework. All things that still disproportionately fall on women's shoulders. Wouldn't you burn out? The fight moves. Cell-free zone. Set boundaries. When you leave the office, the time you stop checking email. Tell people in your email signature block that you do not respond to emails after a certain time. Get down with overtime protection. In workplaces that value overwork, late hours that show a worker's commitment doesn't pay off for women because they bear the brunt of the work at home too. Women are more likely to be evaluated poorly and less likely to be promoted. Max and relax. Men get five hours more leisure time than women per week. Add time into your calendar just to relax to prevent burnout to st- and stop feeling guilty. Ruthless prioritization. Be ruthless about what you say yes to. Cut back on should, musts, and wants. Okay, so these have proved to be really valuable for me. And these are definitely something, a lot of these I've I've really tried to implement. And they are effective. And things can clearly and quickly get out of balance if um, even any one of these um, isn't being... um, if it isn't being done. Yeah, I've, uh, I've, I've done the burnout thing before. And um, actually, I'm, I'm just at the tail end of a massive burnout that I've been in now for 60 days. Um, and you know, it's like I said, I've done this before, and I'm at the I'm at another end of this again. And this current situation is difficult, because it's a situation that was unpreventable. Um, it just it just was but this feeling very tired or exhausted. Um, it's very true. And you get to a point where you have, you know that you're there and you have to do this ruthless prioritization about what is absolutely critical and what's not. And what's funny this time is that I have been pretty much ruthless. Um, and so everything that isn't absolutely critical is gone. And so now it's like, oh, all these things that aren't that important, they aren't that important. And so once I get you know, sort of back from the burnout, um, they're not coming back. And so I'm going to have this like really great extra space in my calendar. And so now I'll be able to fill it um, with other things. And so I think you get to actually learn really cool stuff um, when, you know, after this is done. But I don't just think that the first shift and second one begins relates to kids, laundry, dinner, homework. I think it relates to a lot of people and a lot of different things between that work-life balance. And if you don't make that time, carve out that time after work to to decompress, I think that you always are going to be in that work mode. Um, And that's going to lead to that burnout. And I think that's what she's saying about that self-free zone, stop checking your work email, because you never end up decompressing from work and you never stop that cycle. And that's what's going to burn you. Um, And then eventually you're going to be so exhausted that you're literally going to just collapse. And so I think it's now I'm not necessarily sure I would stick a message in my email signature block. That's a little awkward. Um, But, you know, I think you just have to discipline yourself not to click the icon to check your work email after a certain hour. And, you know, you got to realize most people at some point stop checking their work email at night. Um, You know, you can pick it back up in the morning. Nothing catastrophic is going to happen overnight that you can't answer in the morning. And if it is, then it happens. Um, I mean, unless you're emergency first response or something like that, but let's presume you're not a critical operations employee. Nothing's going to happen between, you know, seven o'clock at night and six o'clock in the morning that, that can't be answered. And if you have a boss that I, I'm, I've talked about this before on the podcast that sent me email at 11 o'clock at night. Great. I can pick it up at five thirty six seven in the morning. Like it's, 
it is what it is. But you got to set those boundaries or you are going to just wear yourself out and you're going to constantly be chasing email. Well, and I think, yeah, I agree with all of that. And it's hard sometimes, especially on the heels of some of these other um, characters we've been talking about, where if you're on that slippery slope and it, it, you're, you're burnt out and you've been opening the door for more work and not saying no, it's like you have to you have to stop that slippery slope in its tracks in order to prevent this. And so, like you said, you've just been through this time of burnout too. And I, I, I'm, I'm trying to ward it off <laughs> too. And it's like, it takes that kind of daily maintenance and reminding yourself that the better care I take care of myself, the better care I take of myself, the better I'm going to be able to contribute to work and home. And I feel most balanced when I kind of compartmentalize work and home. And what I'll also add to that list, which I think is important, is physical fitness and good nutrition. Because for me, that those two things, if they when they're on, I feel much better. And when they're off, it's only going to kind of accelerate that burnout. No, I, I agree. The saboteur, the nervous rambler. Call it a slow train wreck of the mouth. The nervous rambler is not necessarily a talker. She doesn't ramble in nor normal conversation, but when she's on the spot, a presentation, a negotiation, or anything where the stakes are high, her nerves get the best of her and she simply cannot stop talking. She speaks fast, adds extra words, trails off, and then repeats herself until her message is lost in the jumble. We've all been in a situation where we walk out of a high-tension situation and wonder what the hell we just said, but the nervous rambler speaks like the mic is about to be physically yanked out of her hand. The fight moves. 140 characters or less. Try to contain your response to a single conclusive treat, and then stop talking. Track your TMIs. Make a note to figure out what compelled you to keep talking so that you don't make the same mistake again. Deep breaths. Deep breaths tell your sim sympathetic nervous system to chill out and your cortisol to take a break. Silence is your BFF. The long pause gives you time to breathe. It lets the impact of your words hang in the air. It can force the other person to speak first. Okay, all of these are absolutely fantastic points and tips, even if you're not a nervous rambler. So... 140 characters or less. This is a great tip for everybody. So it's this simple, clear, and concise response. Because if you can do this, I mean, this goes for emails, phone calls, conversations. If you can just use one sentence or two sentences, people understand your point. I'm going through at work right now where I'm rolling out a um, massive... Uh, end of a project. I don't want to really get in the details on a podcast, but I'm rolling out a project and I'm going to have to explain this to hundreds of employees. And um, there's going to be this letter that's going out to explain it. And last year, the letter had six paragraphs. This year, I want the letter to have three sentences. Um, and everybody's really concerned and, and a little overexcited that it's not going to have six paragraphs. And I said, three sentences is great. Um, 140 characters or less, right? If you can explain it in three sentences, why use six paragraphs? And in conversations, why use the same, right? In emails, why use six paragraphs when three sentences works? Or three bullets, five bullets. People love that. Uh, you get your message across. The TMIs is the same thing. I have a colleague um, who is doesn't work in my direct department, um, but is definitely into TMIs. And it makes conversations, I think, just really awkward. Um, and then lastly, the long pause. I've started to use this a lot at work, um, especially in, in when I'm talking with people outside of my department. Um, and it creates this very awkward <laughs> sort of tension in the air, but it gets it ends up actually ending the conversation quicker. Uh, yeah, so I'm totally the nervous rambler if I have to stand in front of a group. <laughs> and I know it, and it's horrible, and it's so unexpected every time because I've, I'm, like, completely comfortable in a, in a speaking one-on-one -on -one and in a small group up to a certain size, but it's, like, total stage nerves. Um, so I think a lot of these things have been, are good and actually kind of affirm that I'm on the right track because I've been trying to force myself 
into these situations. And really what I found is obviously just, first of all, write out what I'm going to say if it's a public setting practice it and then just stay on track like do not ad lib and um that's been really really helpful but in my uh envisioning how i'm going to have to even better prioritize and execute my tasks and my work i've also really been thinking about prioritizing my um my words and especially in emails and time with my boss or time with others which are very very limited, uh, trying to be really efficient about what I'm saying to get my point across. So this actually, I like the 140 characters or less. That's actually, I think going to be a good tool that I'm going to, I'm going to try out. Yeah. And I'm actually surprised to hear you say that you're nervous in front of big group. So, um, well, you've been, you, all you guys have been listening to Sonia on the podcast now for 27 episodes, but, um, this is Sonia. She's very comfortable. Um, you know, something, I, I did, I'm, I'm not necessarily a nervous rambler when I present, but I do this thing with my hands. I talk with my hands. Um, so I always move my hands around when I present. And I didn't know I did that until spring of 2003 when I was doing this PowerPoint presentation and the person watching the presentation brought it to my attention because I was actually spinning my hands. Um, and I, I still do it. I still use my hands, but now at least I'm conscious of it. It's my nervous rambling technique. Um, but I generally practice my presentations to myself ahead of time. Um, and that has slowed any kind of nervous rambling because I've literally spoken them out loud. Um, and so I, it just feels more comfortable. The Trap Bitchy, bossy, too ambitious. In early 2016, if you were to Google Bernie Sanders and ambition, you would have found a host of articles about his ambitious plans, think pieces about ambitious healthcare goals, and assorted other posts commending his professional determination. But the same web search for Hillary Clinton would yield just the opposite. Of more than one million results, the top hits would focus on her lifelong personal ambition, unbridled, ruthless, even pathological. In a word, unappealing. Behold the catch-22 of women in power. To be successful, a woman must be liked, but she, to be liked, she must not be too successful, her likability eroded by her professional status. We may all know, or at least like to say we know, that women are perfectly capable as leaders. Yet on a deep, unconscious level, we still find the image of an ambitious woman hard to swallow. The reasoning makes sense. For hundreds of years, it's been culturally ingrained in us that men lead and women nurture. So when a woman turns around and exhibits male traits, ambition, assertion, and sometimes even aggression, we somehow see her as too masculine, not lady-like enough, and thus we like her less." The hacks. Get your sexism in check. Acknowledge your inner sexist. If an ambitious woman rubs you the wrong way, would you feel the same way if she were a man? Gender judo. Combine communal behaviors like friendliness, humor, empathy, or kindness with aggression or ambition. Make female power the norm. Use the sweetness, the ambition, or a combination of the two to get into power. Leadership is defined in male terms because not enough women are in leadership positions. Once you have trailblazed your way up, remember to pull up other women behind you. So this, I, I think in one way, like the, like the def definitions of these words are, it's hard to redefine them. But I would say in all of this, what I really felt is the path that a lot of us should focus on is be aggressive with problem solving and not with people. And it, I think will will be, it'll be more appealing if that's, if, if the opposite is unappealing. I don't know. What do you think about that? Well, I definitely think it's true that men can be aggressive with people and no one says anything. If women are aggressive with people, it comes off as bitchy. And so I've definitely been in that situation before where people have told me I am too aggressive and they're meaning towards people. Um, yet my male colleague who is doing the exact same thing, it, it's fine. So it's, I've definitely, I've, it frustrates the crap out of me. Um, so I've had to tone it down in situations where being aggressive with somebody, generally it's with the guy, um, there's a purpose to me being aggressive and I know I'm being aggressive. Um, and it's just so frustrating when a 
guy is doing the same thing and and is getting somewhere and then I'm called on the mat for it. Uh, I don't mind being aggressive with things. I'm always aggressive with things. I have I go 100 miles an hour. I have no like medium speed. Um, but but when it happens with people, um, there's usually also a reason I'm doing it. So this whole sweetness, nice, empathetic, friendly. I don't know. Those kind of words in some ways make me gag um, because it's like it's just that's the exact pigeonhole boss like box that women always go into. And that's the box I've always avoided because it's like that's just not where I want to be. Um, maybe that does make me ambitious, bossy, bitchy, aggressive. But it's not that I don't have those characteristics. It's just I don't lay down and roll over either. Um I am ambitious. I do like to do things. I am a go-getter. And I don't think that people mistake me for being anything else. But sometimes I do, I am kind of a guy's girl. um, And that is a double-edged sword. So I I look at this one and I kind of think, well, depending on how aggressive you are and depending on how far outside of that typical quote typical girl box you are you've got to know that you're outside that box you got to know that you're a guy's girl and you got to be ready for that sort of fight if you want to call it that like you you got to know what you're doing um and does it suck that you're in that position and that there and that you even have to know and that you even have to do that fight sure sure it sucks but you know what that's reality and you still got to do it so I think it's just being aware of that and just knowing you're going to have to put effort into it and being enough and having enough self-esteem and self-confidence to, to do that and to, you know, stand up and just say, I'm not going to get plowed over when I do this. Um, and, and, you know, having that assertiveness. The trap. She's too nice to lead the team. Being nice shouldn't undermine the perception of a person's competence, yet when it comes to women, we tend to view the two traits as inversely related, a surplus of one leading to the belief you're deficient in the other. So when a woman is nice or even just described as nice, we assume she's dumb, ditzy, or a pushover, when in fact we have no information about her skills at all. The hack. Sweet like arsenic. Use nice to your advantage by mastering the art of being nice and tough all at once. Cloak your demands in sweetness. Give orders or ask for what you need in a pleasant tone. Don't become the office shoulder to cry on or the office mom. Watch your words. Cut the word nice from your vocabulary along with kind, helpful, and team player. These words tend to make women viewed as less qualified, perceived as pushovers. So rather than than describing your female colleague as sympathetic, try a male word. Independent, confident, intelligent, and fair. Okay, I don't... I, I... I think we used this example because I don't like this one at all. I don't think that women in general use these terms. And I think that even talking about this is just, yeah, I don't, I don't know that this is something, this makes me feel kind of weak-willed. I don't know that people, any, like, I don't like, when, when I've mentored women, young professionals in the workplace, this is something that I get rid of very, very early on because I tell them, you're not here to be nice to people. You're here to do a good job. So you're not here to be loved. This is not your family. These are not your friends. Uh, you're here to do a good job. So how you're going to get liked is by performing and doing good work. Yeah, I think this one feels you have to be very careful, like uh, calling it what it is is I don't know if that's even what I mean but um I wonder if the person who was describing like that this is maybe what she was uh she was called too nice to lead or something and I and I almost wonder if she's grasping onto that and holding on to that as an excuse for maybe there was just a lack in ability um and 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 not not in a stereotypical way but um, I think we have to be really careful about labels too, and and sometimes not ever latching onto them or holding onto them at, in in substitute for really drilling down to see maybe what the core issue might be. And so that's where I think this delicate balance in all of these kind of gender roles and gender issues and categories and stereotypes, we have to be really careful that um, 
I don't know, I feel like I have to be really careful to keep focusing on that single standard that we want to establish as opposed to maybe in reinforcing more double standards or holding on to labels as a crutch. Does any of that make any sense? Yeah, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. While we're on the word nice, because this is one of my pet peeves in the office, don't be the woman that always brings the baked goods to the office. Now, there's women that love to bake and cook, and that is awesome because that's your hobby. That is something you love doing, right? So that's your hobby, but here's the problem with that. That's a stereotype. Men think women love to bake and cook, and not all women do. If you do that a lot, you're feeding the stereotype. So you got to be conscious that you're doing that, and you got to sort of do something to counteract that. Because doing that baking and cooking and bringing all that stuff in, that's going to give you these labels, kind, nice, sweet. And so you got, you're going to have to work like extra hard to balance that off. And so I think that that's some of what she's been talking about. Um, and there's some of those, some of those balances that, that you've got to find. Um, but, but again, you know, Sonia, you bring up a good point of, this is, this is all about balance and it's all about sort of finding your way. And, you know, you don't want to spend too much time in the workplace thinking about these gender issues, but you, you want to be conscious of them because they are, as we talked about at the beginning, they are going to be subtle and they're going to be there. So you don't want to go hunting them out, but you do want to realize, especially like we talked about at the beginning, like with the secretary and taking notes, be cautious of that. That one will show up if you're working in an office environment, especially like a Fortune 500 company. That's where those tend to show up. Verbal tripwire, the over-apologizer. Once upon a time, the word sorry was reserved for things a person might actually be sorry for, for spilling wine on the new white silk you borrowed without asking, denting your mother's car, screwing something up like really screwing something up at work. These days, it's more like a crutch, a space filler, a hedge, a way to interject state and opinion, to politely ask without offending, to say, excuse me, or just about anything that involves speaking up or stating opinion at all. Can't we even own the apology or the insult? There are plenty of times when saying sorry actually works. But if your audience is not a prickly individual, but a full conference room or an all a reply all email list, know this. You may say, sorry to, interrupt, sorry to interrupt, but I think. But what you sound like is, I have zero confidence in my idea. Why should you? Threat level. When you're actually sorry. Best. A textbook apology comes if the speaker realizes she has done something harmful or offensive and wants to put the relationship back on an even keel. Apologize and move on. The excuse me, sorry. Okay. Attention getter immediately preceding a request or demand. Delicate throat clearings to mitigate an unpleasant situation or confrontational request. Euphemistic disguise for anger and frustration. The polite sorry. Worst. Social nicety that helps conversation flow. Okay, so I am definitely, <laughs> um, uh, I can be accused of probably any of these versions, because, but I, I've definitely gotten better over the years. And I think I probably most often f fall in the excuse me category where, I, you know, trying to soften things or you, you try to soften things or diffuse things by saying excuse me or sorry um, you know trying to kind of enter a situation that's sensitive but I think that uh, you know sorry can also be a doorway to kind of blurring boundaries which um, can you know kind of lead into that zero confidence um, idea but this is a good reminder for me to be direct, concise, accountable, um, but also holding others accountable. So not, I think saying sorry too often kind of gives away accountability to other people who might actually need to be saying that word. <laughs> yeah, I use, I'm starting to use something else to sort of soften that battle space. If I need to like go in and like do some heavy hitting thing, instead of saying, I'm sorry, um, but now I'm using you know, we must have miscommunicated on this issue. I must have not done a good job communicating with you about what we need to accomplish. So instead of saying, I'm sorry, um, I'm saying I must not have done a good job communicating. 
So it's not me really saying, I'm really sorry, which sounds like an emotional response. Um, I'm just saying, oh, factually, I miscommunicated. Um, I don't know. There's, it just, it sounds to me completely different. And I tend to get a completely different reaction on it. Yeah, I like that a lot. I'll, I'll remember that one. Yeah, I use a couple of others. Um, I also use, oh, this seems like we aren't agreeing on what's happening right now. Um, but it, I say to the facts rather than having that emotional attachment to the situation, because when you release the word sorry, they too are going to hopefully release that emotional attachment and stay to the facts, or at least you are, you're releasing the emotion on your side. So you can have that, you can stay that sort of step away. And then even if they come back emotionally, you're again, you're still that step away so that you can react factually. Um, and, and now you're staying, um, it just, it gives you a better position. Here are some final thoughts on today's episode. Every day when you walk into your workplace, you're faced with challenges, challenges with your boss and your colleagues, challenges with your work and managing your time. With each challenge comes the decision whether to take the easy way or the hard way out. The decision is up to you. The easy way out is to just accept the situation as it is, to ignore the challenge, to pretend that it isn't there, to hope that if you wait another 10 minutes, another hour, another day, another week, it will go away on its own or someone else will handle it for you. The easy way out is to always tell your boss yes. The easy way out is to take on everyone else's work because you're too afraid to speak up for yourself. The easy way out is to bring everyone coffee at the meeting because you're too afraid to say you're not the boss's assistant. The easy way out is to say that your family life isn't as important as his family life. The easy way out is to let him take all the credit for the project. The easy way out is to be too nice to say you're sorry when there is nothing to be sorry about. The easy way out is to always let someone else lead while you sit in the back of the room. But the easy way out is never going to make you better. The easy way out is never going to make you stronger. The easy way out is never going to make you more powerful. And the easy way out is never going to make you a winner in life. No, don't decide to take the easy way out. Take the hard way out. Face that difficult moment and stand and hold your ground. For those seconds, those minutes, those hours, own that space, control that space, and let everyone know that that space is yours. And when you do, when you stand there and feel that strength, that power, that resolve that you have, you will realize that the challenge wasn't a challenge at all. It was an opportunity. And I think that's all we have for today. You can interact with us, follow us, and learn about upcoming episodes on our website at modernathenas.com, on our Facebook page under Modern Athenas, our Twitter at Modern Athenas, and our Instagram at the Modern Athenas Podcast. We would also appreciate if you would support our podcast by leaving us a review on iTunes or Stitcher and subscribing to the podcast. In our next podcast, we will be discussing the book Spy Mistress by William Stevenson. As we leave you today, we want to remind you to never forget that each of you, like all the modern Athenas we've discussed on our podcasts, has the power and capacity to be a change maker in your world. Work hard, dream big, and reach for the stars. <laughs>